My guest this episode is someone who shows that sheer perseverance and determination can pay back in dividends. Sometimes life plans don't go as expected, but when you take the bull by the horns, amazing things can happen. You just have to be able to recognize when an opportunity presents itself. And that is exactly what my guest Alan Lacey did. And he is proof that amazing things can happen. This podcast is proudly powered by Battleborn Batteries. Let the power of lithium take you on your journeys across the outdoor world. Battleborn Batteries is the industry's top choice for lithium ion batteries. Reliable, safe, and long lasting, Battleborn makes the sustainable and lightweight drop in replacement for traditional lead acid batteries. Are you ready to make the switch to lithium and switch to green energy? If so, all batteries are in stock now, and you can shop today at battlebornbatteries.com. Good morning, Alan. Hey, thanks for joining me and taking the time out of your day this morning for the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast. How are you doing? Doing well yourself? Very well. Yeah, yeah. Enjoying this summer weather that is, uh, well, I, we shouldn't speak too much about weather because I know here I always moan about it getting so hot in Reno, <laughs> in Nevada. Um, but you're in Phoenix. And I know I drove back from Phoenix just about three weeks ago. And I know it was, it, it, it was something like 20 degrees hotter in Phoenix. So uh, I'm not going <laughs> to moan about the heat. Yeah, yeah. Now we've, we're definitely masters of the heat over here. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You've got to have good AC. That's for sure. Alan, mm -hmm. the way I the way I start all of these is to um, is to start to kind of know my guest and, and have the listeners learn a little bit about how my guests got into wildlife filmmaking or into the industry. So let's start there. What was it that um, first inspired you to take this journey as a wildlife filmmaker? Oh man, well I think probably like most of us, um, we always. Well, a lot of us start with a passion for wildlife. And for me, that's kind of where it came from. As a young kid, um, I spent, man, countless hours um, outside exploring the wilds, um, pretending to be a biologist. Um, I, I watched a lot of National Geographic documentaries, PBS Nature as a kid, and just developed my love for wildlife watching all those documentaries. And so, yeah, I would spend hours outside in the countryside. In fact, there's this this one story that my parents love to embarrass me with, um, but it kind of like capsulates it in a nutshell. Um, I was about a mile or two away from my house, out by myself, um, and I noticed there was a, a little colony of California ground squirrels on the levee that was just out there. And this is like, I'm in like fourth and fifth grade. I don't know why my parents let me just go off like that, but because um, no way in the world would you do that now. But Man, it was a blast, and just just seeing those ground squirrels and just their behaviors, and interactions, it just was fascinating. And so one day, I got this crazy idea that I wanted to capture one and be like be a little biologist. So I had my brother come out; he's a couple years younger, and again, we're fifth grade and like third grade. And I had brought string and lettuce, and I was going to create a little noose, little you know leg hold, and capture the squirrel and use lettuce as bait. Never, it didn't work, didn't, it was so <laughs> unsuccessful. And uh, my dad actually came driving out on his motorcycle and saw us sitting there, you know, and we were only like probably 20 feet away from the actual burrows themselves. So there's, <laughs> there's no way those things would have come out. Um, and he sees them and he's like, what on earth are you guys doing? And my brother's like, Ellen wants me to catch the stupid ground squirrels. And he was the one holding the string to pull it to try to capture them. And I was actually sitting a little ways packed behind him with my notepad trying to take an observation and notice whatever was going to happen. And, uh, I mean, that's just who I was as a kid. Um, and as I grew up, um, I always kind of wanted to be a biologist, went through the route of, um, well, first through college, I tried architecture and cause I love that too, but, um, I always kept feeling called back to nature. So I tried to do a bio, become a biologist and go through that schooling and the chemistry and the biology classes just didn't jive as well. Um, and so I ended up in aviation, of all things, and working through a flight training facility, got my pilot's license, kind of was going on that route. 
Um, but I have a little issue with color, and so seeing red and greens to fly aviation and to fly airplanes is required, and I wasn't able to pass the medical examination to do that, so I had to like, kind of reset life and figure out, well, what am I going to do? Um, and at the time, I was volunteering at uh, it's called well now it's called the Southwest Wildlife Conservation Center. It was educational and conservation center back at the time, and it's a um, place in North Scottsdale here in Phoenix that um, rescues wildlife from the area, rehabs them back to the wild. But they are also part of the species survival plan for the Mexican gray wolf. And I learned about these wolves there, and there was just something about them when you're cleaning their cages, working with the actual animal you know, care specialists that are going in there. And these wolves wanted nothing to do with me. It was really fascinating. And just their eyes, the way they look at me, it was just, oh, it was just so awesome. Um, and there was just this connection I made there with them. Um, they obviously didn't make a connection with me, but I sure did. Um, and I just wanted to do something to try to make more, either more awareness or just get more people interested in them or just try to help their recovery. Because at the time in the wild, there was only 42 Mexican gray wolves in the wild known to exist. And they were all been re-released back into the wild because they had been exterminated back in the you know, late 1800s or the 1900s, just like all wolves. And um, these are a, a distinct subspecies of the, of the gray wolf. They're um, genetically imperiled as well. And so all these things are just kind of compounded and made this really challenging for these wolves to get a foothold when they really released them back here in the Southwest. And so that just kind of like tugged at me. And then we, my dad and I went camping out in the Eastern mountains of or or Oregon, Arizona here. Um, and, um, it was really amazing to see the habitat. And I had kind of didn't realize that there was wolves at the time that were literally out there. Um, even though I knew they were back in the wild, I didn't know they were in the spot that we had camped and we heard them one night and that just further interested me about like, okay, this is amazing. They're here in this state. And so, um, fast forward a few years, um, I ended up getting married and, uh, um, I got this harebrained idea that I wanted to make a film and I don't know where it came from, but I think thought this might be helpful. Um, so I started doing some research, um, and at the time we were looking to relocate to Oregon. And so I saw some job opportunities throughout the Northwest. And one of them was through this entity called the Grizzly Bear Outreach Project. So I reached out to the director of them, which was Chris Morgan. Um, and I had no clue that he was um, a filmmaker and host and presenter with PBS and National Geographic and all of that. And so I was asking him how I could get involved to establish something similar like that for the wolf. And then, you know, as, as only Chris can do, he was, he said, you know, you can, have you ever thought about making a film? And I said, well, actually that's something I've kind of thought of. He's like, well, you know, he, he says, you don't have to be an expert behind the camera or an expert in front of the um, camera as a biologist, but you can produce and you can, you can pull the strings and make it happen. And he gave me a lot of inspiration that kind of just really gave me the confidence to launch full-time into it. We're well, not full-time, but just in terms of at least this, this project. And so, um, kind of off I went and I was originally going to go with just my camcorder, which I would, it would have been a terrible film <laughs> if I didn't try it myself at that point. Um, but I ended up reaching out to um, a gentleman who helped me actually get started in that filmmaking process. His name was Dean Cannon. He's where he'd worked with Chris and uh, one of Chris's good friends, Joe Pontecorvo. Um, and uh, actually Joe, actually Joe's the one that introduced me to, to Dean. And then Chris was like, yeah, man, use him. Um, and so together we set off and, um, it was awesome to work with someone who actually had camera experience, knew what they were doing. Um, and he would just be, he would give me ideas of how to go back and do more research, more, more producing kind of things. Um, and I would just go head first into it, figure out what I needed to be done. It was never perfect. Um, but in the long run, it took us seven years, almost, almost eight years and $80,000 to produce it. Um, and did all that through fundraising. So just peacetime little by little by little. And at the end of it, we had a an hour doc that um, screened around the U.S. internationally, picked up like 15 awards for, and I mean all small little festivals, nothing nothing insane, but um, for the first time making a film, I was super proud of it and pretty excited to see how how well it done. Um, and it, the year that we finished filming was the year that the Mexican gray wolf population as a whole broke through 100 in the wild. Um, so it was really cool to document that. 
Um, and it was also the same and year that they is, introduced. This is gray Hulk. area. This is gray. Correct. Area. Yeah, gray area. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, gray area I, well, was the I've southwest. got to ask yep. you some stuff before because you, there's so much to unpack there. Um, I mean, first of all, what, what's fascinating is what I, what I love is that you you had never done anything like that before. You met someone who inspired you, and Chris is extremely inspiring. Uh, and and then you just went out there and you did it. And of course, that is one of the pieces of advice that everyone gives on this podcast: is just go and do it. Just start. Mm-hmm. And you did that. You took the bull by the horns, which is fantastic. Tell me that from from the point of view of you know when you met the people that you you were working with at, at that moment in time, how did you decide to fund it? You said that you got in, uh, you were kind of crowdfunding or, or you know getting small bits of money. And when when you initially made contact with people, how were you thinking about okay, how am I going to fund this at this point? Because obviously people are going to want paying, or were they doing it? pro bono uh you know to get you started i was kind of a mix of both honestly um so for for the gentleman that i hired he you know obviously i paid him um there's no way that i would feel good about myself to put that much work and energy into something and and require uh, the main camera guy to, to not get paid so of course he got he got his um but a lot of the other folks along the way you know would either offer discounts you know getting hotels for either discounted rates. Um, sometimes, sometimes we were able to stay free in places, um, in the Southwestern, like there's a place we stayed in for free. Actually, we, no, we, we ended up giving them something just out of, cause we had extra in our budget. Um, but they had offered it to us for free as a little man. It was probably built in 1860. It was a cute little old house in the middle of the Gila wilderness. Um, <laughs> really cool place. Um, you, almost, almost drafty from the wind from the night, but it was awesome. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of pro bono here and there. Um, but, you know, I, when I could, I definitely would try to cover people's expenses or portions or portions of it. Um, but that was probably the way I was able to make it work, um, is just the kindness of people, the generosity of people. Um, yeah. And the fundraising part of it was extremely challenging as well. Um, having never done that before either was, um, probably one of the hardest things I've ever done, but I've, I learned a tremendous amount about how to actually go about and doing that and, you know, still learning, still figuring that part of it out, but that was challenging. What were the specifics with that? How did you um, how did you first start fundraising? Because these are the these are this is probably up there with the top two questions that are ever asked about starting to become get into this industry. People want to they think that you know when you start off you're going to have to work for free, you're going to have to intern, you you know you're never going to see any money for the first few years. But if you're starting your own projects, you know there are ways to do this, and I think one something you mentioned there's really valid is that you can ask hotels can I stay for free this is what we're working on you know you could uh, you know there, there's ways of not actually needing to have the cash necessarily if you can get stuff for free but how did you get your first money in so the first bit of money that I had come in um, I think at the time Kickstarter all of a sudden just launched on the scene I think a few years prior but I caught wind of it and was like oh this is amazing so I actually created a Kickstarter campaign um, and I thought this looks amazing and uh, we created a little video that would go with it that would kind of give a little snapshot of what we were going to do. And I hit the launch button and was so excited to see how it would be because just I figured tons of people would just donate. And I think I raised like right. like nine grand, but my goal was thirty or something. And uh, obviously we didn't get it, and it failed spectacularly in that sense. Um, and so I was kind of like, you know, depressed, a little dejected, like, oh man, how is this going to work? So I found another campaign or. or platform called Indiegogo, which allowed you to keep whatever you raise and they just take a higher cut if you didn't hit your actual mark. Um, so I tried that route. Um, and this time I kind of got smart and I thought, well, you know, just hitting launch doesn't do the trick. So obviously I've got to do some legwork to make it happen. So I started reaching out to other networks, um, such as, or nonprofit organizations rather that work with wolves, um, that are passionate also about the same cause. So, a lot of entities around the United States that work with Mexican gray wolves. I reached out to them um, and they had huge social media followings um, collectively in the millions. Um, And so I figured this is a great opportunity. If it's something that they're willing to help promote my project, um, then, you know, this is a win-win. The wolves get helped. My project is helped. And um, then on the back end of things, I would let them use my film as a part of their fundraising mechanism too. So, give the Blu-rays to them at a, 
at a, obviously a discounted rate so that they could sell it and make profit off of it too. Um, and so um, that was the ticket. So between all the organizations, myself pushing that campaign, um, and this time I instead of rate asking for 30 or whatever, five, I think I asked for 25 and ended up getting 30. Um, so that was the initial push that got us the ability to get cameras rolling, get out there and to start filming. And I did an, did one more campaign after that just to kind of help with the final touches. But in between, I had a lot of private donations too. So that's another key that I kind of focused on was reaching out to either personal friends or making connections with people that are also passionate about the same subject um, or conservation, wildlife, whatever, whatever medium that you can use to kind of get into um, and, and make an in with somebody. So I ended up connecting with a few people that um, had the means to support on a, on a higher level than I have ever received. Had a couple thousand dollar, a five thousand, a ten thousand that came in, um, and those were the other ones that helped fund the secondary shoots that we went on later. Um, and I think for me, what I learned the most about that um, is is one obviously do not be afraid to ask because um, that's that's always been a struggle for me is I'm just I'm too reserved or I feel like, you know, it's harder and money that they made. Why, you know, who, who am I to ask if they want to uh, support this, this entity, this film that's about wolves, or if it's, you know, whatever it's about, like, why would they want to do that? And then it's like, okay, well, no, sometimes maybe it's offering them an, an, an opportunity that they want. To, um, and then, then when I actually realized, oh, I could use a nonprofit entity as a fiscal sponsor, it makes that ask so much easier because now they have an ability that they can actually make a tax deductible donation um, and it helps them out in their, in their long run for them and it benefits um, the project as well. Um, so I ended up partnering with um, one of the Wolf Education and Research Center um, and uh, they were my fiscal sponsor, allowed me to bring funding in and um, that was how I brought in some of those larger donations that I talked about. Um, and that was, that was probably one of the biggest things and it's pointed me on a path now where I'm actually looking at you know, this is probably down the road in our conversation, but actually starting a nonprofit um, so that I can actually do that and function on my own rather than using fiscal sponsors. But that's, yeah, huge. You know, don't be afraid to ask is kind of the big takeaway that I had from that. Yeah, I mean, that that's amazing. And the hard thing about asking when it's your own project is that, you know, there's always this kind of creeping, you know, worry of, is it good enough? You know, just because I like it, will other people like it? Am I, am I an imposter? You know? <laughs> exactly. Can oh, I really man, I do suffer this? With that. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I think any artist, anyone making art, whether it's art, you know, a painting or a film always finds it hard to ask for money for the things they're creating because, because of that. Um, but, but, you know, what, what, what I would like to find out, Alan, is what was the biggest thing you learned? I mean, that, that was a huge thing to turn, take on. I mean, you had some great people that you knew around you, Chris, Joe, Dean, you know, th those people obviously knew what they were talking about. So you had some backing of people around you and people to, you know, spur you on. But, but going through something like that for, I think you said eight years, that's a long time and it's a big project. And even when you know what you're doing, it's hard, right? As we know now, it's still a hard thing to do. So what were the biggest things you learned from that experience? I would say for myself, I learned, you know, well, there's obviously so many, it was great because you get to learn the whole process from start to finish. Obviously I didn't go to school to learn how to do it. So there's, you know, a lot of things that I just sort of figured out on my own probably don't do right. But there, is there a right way? Yeah, we, you know, that's obviously not, there's, there's no right way. Um, but uh, I think when I sit back and think about all of that process, I learned that I can do something. I mean, it's simple, it just kind of comes down to that. I can do it, whatever I put my mind to, I can do. Um, and when you when I when I boil that down, it, it tells me so much about who I am as a person. Um, that you know, growing up, the wildlife thing as a as a child, it was kind of always. I mean, it wasn't like I was made fun of, but you know, I was called nature boy. There was all these little monikers that were given to me, and it, and it kind of it always kind of rubbed me just a little bit weird because it was almost it was almost kind of looked down on. Is kind of what it felt like to me, and so I was kind of had this like it felt like shadow over me growing up through 
my love for wildlife and nature. And I think the film gave me the empowerment to realize, hey, that this is something I can follow my dreams and my passions and I, I can do. And um, that no matter what, you know, trial or, or challenge that would present itself when we were making that project and that documentary, we always figured out a way to overcome it, figure out a way through it. Um, and it kind of like paved the roadmap for me looking forward. Um, so in all the projects that I've worked on since then, you know, not a ton, but um, it's helped give me the confidence to move forward and feel like, okay, you know, I still, I would say I suffer a little bit, like you mentioned earlier from imposter syndrome a little bit. Um, but that, that success from that project allows me to go, okay, no, I know what I'm doing. You know, I can do this and this is something that I enjoy is what I'm passionate about. And, um, I can make these films. And so I have this, this vision of, uh, kind of compiling an entity through this nonprofit of being one of the, you know, maybe, I don't know, I wouldn't say the premier place in North America to make films, but you know, I want to be a, an entity that people go to that make films and that has a good network of camera people, directors, producers, you know, the whole works. Um, and just, I feel like there's a way we can all work together. Cause that's, that's another thing I learned is how to work together with people. Um, and so I'm all about inclusion, you know, rather than like taking an idea and holding on to it and not letting anyone know about it. Well, that's, there's people out there that have way better skills than I do, way better skills at directing, producing, you know, filming, um, researching than I do. And so um, why not use them? Why not work with them? Why not, um, you know, learn how to work together in a, on a bigger way? Because we're all working towards the same goal of trying to make this world a better place through our films and our stories and to connect people to nature in ways that are powerful. So I think it's an important uh, thing to be able to work together in that in that sense to be able to to tell those stories that the, the the general viewer can just attach themselves to and fall in love like the way we have. Yeah, that, that's that's great because I think that so many people breaking into the industry find it hard actually to make connections and collaborate because so much of the time if you're a filmmaker out there on your own with your camera you know so many of us are just on our own and it can be a very lonely place we're out there creating our art and then it can be really hard to connect and work out how to collaborate and i think you know what's so great is you learn collaboration early on which is such a key as you say to this industry because we can we ha sometimes we feel like we have to do it all and we can't do everything really, really well. And so if you can find those key people, and that takes me on to, you know, you founded TLP Media, um, and then and, and you have uh, a team of people there. So tell me, how did you discover those people? How did you find each other and all start working together with TLP? Yeah, so um, yeah, TLP, it's just a little quick little side note. Um, TLP was the original initials for uh, what I was starting my Grey Wolf film, because I originally called it The Last Pack. So I wanted to kind of pay homage to that as a little fun thing. But anyways, um, so when I moved to Oregon, um, uh, I kind of like moved away from the roots of where I was at in Arizona, the Wolves, my filmmaking connections there. And so um, I couldn't actually, uh, I, I looked for jobs in the film industry there, but just couldn't get in. Um, that whole struggle, you know, how do you break into the industry? I was really trying both in the commercial uh, narrative and documentary worlds and just didn't seem to have a chance of getting in anywhere. So I ended up taking a job at a hospital and working night shift, which was really hard. Um, the job was easy, but the hours. Um, and that drove me again to like, well, I want to follow my dreams and passions. So I started, you know, networking with people around the Northwest to try to um, figure out who's doing what. And connect with a gentleman in Seattle. Um, and uh, together we kind of thought, oh, maybe we can work together on some projects. Um, and then uh, we ended up pairing up with another gentleman in, who happened to actually live in Portland, which I didn't know, who's a photographer. Um, his gym, he's the uh, also on my website. He's, he's kind of the executive producer on a project I'm working on right now in Birmingham's awesome guy. Um, and his photography is fantastic as well. And um, we kind of like brainstormed this idea of producing uh, a story on, on burrowing owls that we're currently still in production on. Um, just got to a rough cut, so pretty excited about that. Um, and together with him and a friend of his who's also a cameraman, um, we collectively kind of moved forward. And I already had TLP Media kind of going, but brought them on as part of the people I collaborate with. Um, and it's just been an absolute blast working with them. Jim has um, a lot of really awesome equipment, you know, like the Canon 50 to 1000, which is like that, that wildlife lens. It's amazing. Um, 
so, so the footage we have for our Browning L doc is just superb, um, paired with like a red camera and such. Um, so like it was amazing to move from the little things that I've been working on to also having all this top notch gear. Um, so it was really really quite awesome um, to set to like finally have good quality images coming back. Not saying that the gray area wasn't good quality, but it was not 4K. It was just it was filmed I think on a like a Sony PMW EX3 or something like that. So just 1080, still good, still good image. But um, the stuff that we have now is just so much better. And it was just, it's just cool to see that footage. So it kind of worked with them um, on getting that up and running. And it's still pretty much just a kind of, just a me, a kind of one man show. I still do all the producing, all the writing and story and whatnot. And Jim's kind of our executive producer who helps us out um, with the gear and such. Um, and then, and then Johnny also films with us. Um, he's the, the cameraman that we have. And then I um, ended up partnering up with a, a friend of mine, uh, her name is Jessica, and she's great at uh, all the logistics. So helping kind of keep things on track um, has been been huge because I, I do that myself, but sometimes it's, you know, like a lot of us creatives, our stuff's all over the place. So having having something that's really kind of kept and filed in an organized way is helpful. So she's really good at that. Um, and then it really helps keep our projects moving forward. <laughs> it's kind of an important thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the whole right right brain, left brain thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> it can be hard. It can be hard to juggle between the two, for sure. So so how are you funding these projects now? I know on your website you've got um, the lone uh, Wolverine, I believe you're working on, uh, the Burrowing Owls. You've got a whole bunch of things on there. Are you... Are you still, you know, do you self-fund a lot of that? Are you bringing in funds? Are you pitching these ideas and getting funds in from networks? How, how are, they, are they all different? Is it a mix of all those things? It's kind of a mix. Um, like our, our Al doc is pretty much uh, all self-funded um, through um, our executive producer. Um, and so he's he's put a lot of the legwork into that to help you get going. So that was, that was a huge thing. And when we talk about finding ways to get funding, um, we didn't, partner up on that with the idea of that becoming a possibility. In fact, I had no clue that that was a possibility. Um, and it ended up just becoming that. And it was just actually incredible um, to be able to have that ability to just go and do for the first time, rather than having to wait, you know, months, years, whatever, till you get funding. Um, and then um, the Lone Wolverine is, is a mix of donations from people, um, grants, you know, grant writing and getting small little grants to come in. And that one's a really, really, really low budget. Um, just, I kind of try to, I, I kind of challenged myself to try to tell a story as low budget as possible. Plus COVID happened at the exact time we were in production. So it was, that was very critical to figure out a way to, to make the funds work as best they could because everything shut down, obviously. Um, so we had to, you know, postpone a couple shoots and actually cancel a couple. Um, so that, that story is still in the edit and it's a challenge to edit because everything is so the way that COVID impacted those shoots, it just really made it a, quite a, a hard thing to piece the story together. Um, but I think we're going to be able to get it and work it out. But yeah, the funding came through grants on that and donations and, and these other projects that I have um, kind of in development. Um, I'm, I have some seed donations that have come in for our story on the Orca Southern resident killer whales up there. And so I'm actually potentially this summer going to look at a couple location scouts and, maybe start a little pilot episode or, you know, for, for pitching for more funds to try to get that up and going. That's, that's another key. It's having these little um, proof of concepts, if you will, of your film. I mean, for those of you in the industry, a lot of you guys do this already, but it helps bring that funding in, um, especially for people who maybe I have a, a clue. If you're, if you're raising the funds yourself or, you know, working with a broadcast entity or, or have, in that been commissioned, um, you can kind of work the same way and operate the same way by bringing these stories and these proofs of concepts to people who are interested in the subject. They may not give as much and be able to commission it full time, like boom, but you can get a portion of it. Um, just takes a little more legwork, a little more um, ingenuity and creativity to figure out how to find those people and network with those people. You know, when, coming back to one of your questions asked earlier about what I've learned, I think networking, I hadn't put a thumb on it, but the networking ability um, to be able to connect with people has probably been the, the biggest life skill I've learned from the whole process. And which is so important. I mean, in, in so many industries, pretty much in every industry, but certainly in this where, 
you know, sort of going back to how we all can feel so remote and alone when we're on our own filming. Um, and, and then when you go to festivals and you realize, wow, everyone is actually like me. We're, we're all the same. We're all doing that little thing, you know, unless you work with a big network and you're in an office full of, you know, lots of people. Most of us are out here on a limb doing our thing. And, um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's great to realize. And when you work that out, and again, it's one of the pieces of advice that so many guests have given, you know, festivals, networking, so important. And now, of course, it's got so much easier because there's so many virtual opportunities. Um, you know, I just had a meeting earlier with a network with four of us over Zoom. And, and now that's just become the norm. You know, it used to tend to be a phone call or you'd meet up or something, but now it's just the norm. You, It can happen so easily. And having virtual passes to all of these festivals where you can see people's faces, it's so unbelievably valuable. Um, and, and I think, you know, what you're doing so well is you are piecing together all of these opportunities, which you have to do in this industry it is a case unless you're getting a complete budget from a network you have to find all these kind of ways of piecing everything together to make your dreams a reality and um and you're doing that so well and so many of my other guests have done that really well as well just finding good ways i think dan o'neill was one who spoke about you know sponsorship sponsorship opportunities and utilizing footage to help brands but then to help with his films it, it can be that you know they, there's not one right way of doing it and there's so many new ways of doing it and what's exciting is how these newcomers find interesting ways to fund things i think it's it's incredible and so important I recently got introduced to Athletic Greens as a way to optimize for better gut health, get more energy, and optimize the immune system. So what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. It's a lifestyle-friendly brand, which means whether you're eating keto or paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, it's going to work for you. It contains less than one gram of sugar. There's no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. And for every purchase, Athletic Greens is going to donate to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry here in the U.S. In fact, in 2020 alone, Athletic Greens donated over 1.2 million meals to kids. And not only that, Athletic Greens is a climate-neutral certified company. Again, in 2020, Athletic Greens purchased carbon credits to support projects protecting old growth rainforests. That's huge. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with the convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. So to make it easy... Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do to get this deal is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash emerging. That's E-M-E-R-G-I-N-G. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash emerging to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to the show. And Alan, you, you also, I know, recently in the last few years have made a foray into kind of uh, YouTube and filming filming in the wild, I think your, your series is called. Um, tell me a little bit about that. What was the premise behind um, in doing that? Because I know from being out, I just got back from a shoot and when we are required to do this was for a network and we're required to do behind the scenes uh clips you know for them to use on social media it, it adds a lot to it i was speaking with jamie mcpherson and he was saying you know it's easy because he it's just part of the part of the course now i find it pretty difficult 
because suddenly I have to switch my brain over to okay, I gotta I gotta now focus on me and getting some other form of content. Um, you know, t tell us a little bit about how you do that. Uh, yeah, it is a challenge to <laughs> to to switch your brain over from okay, we're telling a cool story to how do I tell the story that I'm telling the story about the story I'm telling. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so. Um, I think what I just basically kind of decided one day that, you know, there's, I kept getting a lot of people asking like, what's it like to, you know, to go out and film and do stuff. And, um, I thought, you know, after, instead of explaining it all the time, why not just show them? Um, and so I just, um, on our Brewing Owl project, there's been a lot of hours of just obviously sitting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for an owl to jump off of a stick or fly off a stick and come back. Um, you know, sit for three hours and wait for the dang thing to move. And so like, what do you do? Um, so I, um, had plenty of time. So I thought, okay, why not start here? And, uh, the hardest thing I about that is actually being on camera. I hate, <laughs> I hate being on camera. I have so much respect for all of the hosts and people who actually go in front of camera and talk, um, like yourself, um, to be able to, to actually be able to talk because I'll, I'll start talking about something next thing I'm knowing I'm talking about the spaghetti I had last week. I'm like, where did, how did I even channel my brain into this concept or why am I talking about this? Um, that's what it feels like at least. Um, so yeah, I hate being behind camera. So it's also kind of like refined some of those skills. Cause I think when I started, it was just like, man, it, I'd have so much just nothing to, to even edit and you learn a lot about like oh man this is this is this is bad <laughs> this, this is this isn't good and it's kind of refined my ability to be behind camera but i think what's the, one of the more important reasons why i kind of decided to do this behind the scenes thing is is one um to show people kind of what it's like to make uh, wildlife documentaries and the the ins and outs the trials the, the challenges that wildlife filmmakers or producers film directors etc that we have in the industry um and when you're on a shoot, what it's like, some of the things that might pop up, um, some of the things that we do to try to overcome. Now, I'm not like always out shooting and filming. Um, I don't have uh, full time work in the industry yet. So it's kind of like when I get jobs or when I decide to go out and film something on my own, that's what I end up doing. And I I take the, the, the viewers along with me just sort of, you know, I figured off there if they came along with me, what would that how would I how would I show them while I'm out here? Um, and so that's kind of the. the the brain I kind of get into when I get out and do that. And it's been kind of fun. Um, I think the second thing that about it that I, I, I wanted to do is um, I hate editing. <laughs> I hate editing. And, and um, I always, on my bigger projects, I obviously bring in a, an editor who's that's their job and they know how they know all the ins and outs way more than I do, which is, you know, getting, getting, getting back to putting the right people in the right places. Um, but I, I, I wanted to, learn how to do that. And I wanted to try to figure out the process. So when I talk with an editor, I know what I'm talking about instead of just being a, a kid that just decided to make films one day and say, Hey, I want you to do that. And then not realize what I just said might take months to chop everything up. What I just destroyed or whatever, and bring it back. So, so learning the process. So that's kind of where that whole idea came in is, okay, I can learn it. I can learn how to tell stories myself, how to edit and cut, um, and do all of the, um, the basic edit, and figure all the pieces out, know how to work with the programs, um, whether it's DaVinci or, or Premiere, et cetera. Um, started on Final Cut um, per, uh, 10. So I've kind of worked on all these three different platforms, but it's been really helpful to, to really see how to put a story together um, over that process. And now it's just, you know, now I actually, you know, enjoy it is when you go out and you get really cool images, really beautiful stories and being able to put that on a timeline it's a whole nother realm of creativity that I originally didn't realize was possible. And it's really fun. I still get frustrated with it. I think everybody does, but um, it is a lot of fun. The one, the one challenge kind of getting back to um, before being a little bit of red, green, colorblind, I can't do color very well. So I usually have to have somebody help me with that. But um, that's the one challenge I have in the industry. Um, but I have to learn how to, or I've, I've learned more or less Kelvin scale ballparks of where different colors of light is. So when I set up cameras or, or color correct, I kind of know where I'm at, at least in the vicinity. So I don't have purple looking people. You're so. right. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. yeah, you know, I, I am a, I'm the same as you. I, I, I edit, I edit quite a lot. 
but I'm not a fan of it. So the more of that I can farm out, the better. Color correction, I, I'm not colorblind, but I am terrible at color correction. I mean, I just, it's one of, it's the bane of my life. When I get to a point with S-Log and I have to start working with curves, I, I lose it. You know, it starts, it starts doing that <laughs> thing where it starts out not looking too bad and then I overcorrect and overcorrect and I come back the next day, I go, what was I doing? <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> yep. so yeah, I have to rely on the scopes more than I do of actually what it looks like. But again, farming out, knowing when, knowing what your limits are and when you should be farming out is what it's all about. And, um, and I think mm -hmm. that's so valid. But going back to what you were saying about trying all these different software and learning how to put stories together, it's so valid because as a producer, I mean, really, whatever role you're in, knowing how to tell a story is such an important part. I mean, the most important part for anyone. Because, you know, if you're a camera person and you don't know how to tell a story, you're not going to film the right images. If you're a producer, you have to know how to put a story together because typically that's what you're doing. You know, if you're a sound person, understanding how the story is going together so you're not confused or so you know where to point the mic or, you know, it's so valid. And, and again, if you're producing and you learn to edit and you can really see how the edit system functions and how putting a story together can work, it helps you when you're sat with an editor and you're, you know, brainstorming ideas. So it's so valid in so many ways. Do you do you think that the um, the filming in the wild? Do you think that has a potential for monetization? Do you think it's something that you can grow into being a subsidy for your films potentially? I mean, it's always possible, I suppose. Um, I mean, it would be nice if it could do that, but I'm not anticipating the channel to actually bring in any revenue. Um, I'm, I've set it up so that it can, if it ever would get to that point. Um, it re, you know, the thing I've learned about YouTube is it does, it requires a lot of consistency in posting, you know, on a, on a weekly, if not biweekly basis. Um, and I don't get out enough to actually hold that schedule. Um, you know, maybe I've thought about maybe trying to just sort of go out on little adventures here and there, just to, you know, whether I'm working on a project or not, but just getting out and filming, keeping my skills kind of on, on par would probably be a good idea. And I think if I did that, it would probably, um, gain a little more traction than, than what it is. But, um, you know, it, it definitely has potential. Um, cause I, you know, there's a lot of wildlife channels out there that are doing very well. Um, I think you actually have probably, or you, I think you've talked with, is it Coyote Peterson? I think you've yeah. probably talked with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously his channel's done amazing. Oh, incredible. Um, there's other well, folks yeah. out there that I, I yeah. Um, other folks that I follow that do more photography-based wildlife stuff. And they're they're really, um, they've got a lot of followers are doing well as, and I think, I don't know if they're doing it full-time, but, the, you know, if they're not, that's they're, they probably have the ability to. Um, I think Morton Hilmer, he's based over... I don't know if it's Sweden or somewhere over there, um, but he uh, he's got over three hundred thousand followers on his channel, and his photography and his videography is just absolutely beautiful. Um, and he's great at storytelling too. He he uses a lot of natural sound, which I love. Um, it just really draws you into the environment. Um, so there's people out there that are doing that and doing very well at it. And you know, I just I haven't decided to just go full bore for that yet. Um, because I obviously have other projects that I'm working on and doing is kind of my priority. But if it could end up on the back end becoming a monetized thing, that would be awesome. I would I would certainly have no problem problem with that. But you, is, you wouldn't mind taking the money. <laughs> so so exactly. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, it does require the work. Of course, of course. Like, I mean, everything does. And it, 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 as you say, consistency with that kind of thing, you've got to be any of these endeavors. You've got to be consistent, and you've got to treat it as a business. I mean, that is. That's one of the things mm -hmm. with wildlife filmmaking that's so hard that the whole left brain, right brain thing is as creators, it can be really hard to switch over to, okay, now I have to invoice and I have to keep my books and I have to do taxes and I have to work out where the next, you know, pennies are coming from, et cetera, et cetera. It can be really hard to switch over. I struggle with that all the time. You know, and I have to kind of do it day by day. Okay, today is a book work day instead of, you know, and I, I will keep my creative brain switched off rather than trying to switch back and forth. Um, in terms of the future of TLP, you, you were talking about, uh, you know, potentially converting or, or opening a, a 5013C, um, a, a non-profit. Um, 
you were talking also i think you mentioned about work you know being able to be a center a, a place for people to come and, uh, and make films with you so how do you see that working do you see it as being like a fiscal sponsor for other projects so that you can help you know be a producer on their projects because that is is a really useful thing i, I certainly used a fiscal sponsor in the past for projects and it's so so useful as you say when you're asking for money yeah. So, um, yeah, I've, basically this year I decided, um, cause I've had a life change recently. So I, it's actually, um, allowed me to launch full time into pursuing this passion of filmmaking rather than always having to have a consistent job, pay the bills. This has been the first year I have launched full time, um, into this whole industry and it's been amazing. And in this process, um, I decided to launch this 501c3, um, and, work towards that. So, um, my current name is TLP media. Um, and one of the challenges I've had with that name, which I did not anticipate, um, is on social media. TLP is also an abbreviation for a far right extremist political party in Pakistan. Uh -huh. So I have had, I've had a lot of, um, uh, followers come from there. And so it's been, a, it's, that's been a challenge. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I want my entity to kind of have that connection. So I've decided to change the whole name together. Um, and then just formulate a brand new entity. Um, and uh, so that that new entity, I haven't really announced it yet, but I feel like it's fine to announce here because it's kind of a we're all in the oh, same boat. Oh, this is going to be a first. It's, I'm drum roll. Call it, it's a yeah. first. Yeah. Yes, drum roll. <laughs> um, but <laughs> so it's going to be called Real Earth Films, but R E E L. Nothing, nothing big, fancy, but just kind of sure. a double meaning to me because yeah. it's obviously film, but telling real stories about natural world. Um, and uh, the whole premise and mission behind it being is to tell authentic stories about nature to help inspire people to fall in love with it the way that we have um, so that people can just reconnect to nature. Um, and so that's, that's the whole premise behind what I want to do with this organization is be able to bring in funding from the public and private and uh, be able to utilize that funding to tell stories that I want to tell, but then also be able to work with other filmmakers so either whether it's becoming a fiscal sponsor um maybe eventually um portioning out small little film grants um and just helping other filmmakers like myself who don't have a route like they haven't figured out how to get into the industry or they want to because i feel like there's so many people that are talented out there that um just you know we all know how hard it is to break into the industry whether you're trying to get on as assistant camera or runner or whatever your job title is to get going in the industry it's hard to get in. So I want to be able to help those kind of people like myself who either are blazing a trail forward on their own, um, provide a little guidance. Um, but and at the same time, it also, you know, allows them to in improve their skills and their storytelling abilities and then grow a network of people that you can work with to tell even better stories. And I look at um, other nonprofit organizations that work within wildlife and a lot of the big, the big names, you know, like World Wildlife Fund and all these other defenders of wildlife, you know, they bring in a lot of um, awesome revenue for their, for their causes, which are all important. And so I think to myself, why can't a, a wildlife film entity bring in something similar? Um, doesn't have to be the same level of funds. I mean, if we brought in that kind of level of fund every year, that'd just be, I mean, you'd be putting planet earth out every year. Um, so if you could just bring in, you know, a small portion of what these entities can bring in, you're, you're set for telling quite a few stories each year. Um, again, it comes down to the work to be able to bring in the network of people that can support that cause. But I, I, I believe it is something that is highly possible to do and to be able to bring, you know, a couple mil every year in through donations um, or grants or et cetera would just be an extremely powerful in the ability to be able to tell stories and untold stories, um, whether they're, um, cause a lot of like networks, you know, they want to tell the story that's going to get the viewership that gets, you know, gets the ratings. So it's just kind of all based on that, which we know. So there's a lot of stories that just go untold because they're not a, they're not a, a charismatic species or a sexy species or something that's just going to pull viewers in, you know, unless you can or find a really yeah, cool way to, to make them. So to, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, exactly. Dramatic enough. So, you know, who's going to sit down and watch an hour documentary on ringtail cats? Um, you know, that's a, it's a little project I want to do. Um, it's they're cute and they're fun. There's a really, really quirky little species. Um, but nobody, you know, would probably commission a project unless there was something really amazing that came out of that, that we just don't, don't know yet. Um, 
So telling these untold stories is something that I'm passionate about. And I think it'd be really cool to be able to allow other filmmakers who are also wanting to tell their stories that they're passionate about that are same, same kind of thing that a network probably wouldn't commission or, but when they, if it's told beautifully, if we, f- we help them craft the story, we figure out, you know, here's, you know, if they, if they're not sol- solid in all their filmmaking skills yet, but we can help get them to that point, then, um, you know, that, that story will be amazing. Um, and it could maybe, maybe it could live either on a platform like water bear or some other entity that's kind of out there that's starting up. Um, or maybe it just lives on YouTube for free for people to see, um, just to connect people. Um, the distribution side of things is one element I am not, I haven't figured out yet. That's the one, the one kicker for me, but I would love to be able to get these stories out there in a way where if it's not on a network, it's got to live somewhere. It's got to do something. Um, and then I think through the nonprofit world, it kind of takes the pressure off of having your films have to return revenue. I mean, that's obviously the goal. You want to be able to make your films still generate revenue, even within the nonprofit world, it just can't make profit. Right. So that's still a goal, but it does take some of that initial pressure off. Um, so you can focus maybe some on those stories or the same way, like maybe some of those stories you were, you go, I don't even need to worry about making a profit on it. It's just a really cool story. It's a great conservation mission. This is the way we're giving back to the community. We're going to tell this story. So that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, the concept that I'm, I'm moving into with my nonprofit organization in, in mind, trying to set it up, um, getting, getting our board of directors together, getting all the little pieces put in place so that when we launch it, um, hopefully we can make sure we make a, a, a decent splash at the beginning to give it some momentum so that it can actually, you know, fare well and do well. Um, cause I, like I said earlier, I kind of have this idea of wanting to be an entity that is, that produces high end quality content, whether it's blue chip or or, you know, more in situ conservation with a biologist, et cetera. Um, but just high end content that's engaging for viewers to that fall in love with nature. Um, and you know, you, cause it seems like a lot of the industry, obviously it's, it's over in the UK and Bristol, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of filmmakers all throughout the U S here too, but we're kind of just all over. There's not a central thing. So I'd love to be able to figure out a way to just to connect everybody here to also be able to help produce and make more, more, more of a splash um, from this side of the sea to really make some really good content for people to really fall in love with nature. And that's kind of my, my personal mission is help people fall in love with nature. I think it's a, a fantastic idea. I really do, Alan. You know, um, I mean, from, from so many angles, one, you've got passionate people who, who want to make films who need help. Because as we said earlier, it can be a lonely place to be, but especially when you're starting out and you just don't understand the system. And it can be, a, it's a hard system to understand because there's no real path. Um, and, you know, we all work hard to stay in this industry. I mean, stay relevant in this industry. So having a, um, a, 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 a place that is easily accessible, I think that's the most important thing because even though you know, I have, you know, experts and incredible filmmakers on this podcast giving their advice. It still can be daunting if you're just starting out to to try and sit at a virtual table at Jackson Wild, you know, virtual conference or to go to a conference and go up and shake someone's hand and start talking to them. Um, and it can feel like you have to spill your guts on everything you're doing, you know, when you do speak to someone rather than just let it organically flow. And so, you know, there is that pressure when you're starting out to try and achieve and, and sometimes it feels like it's not working. And, and you've and how do you keep that going? So having a place that's that, that is open to ideas um, almost like an incubator, I think is is fantastic. And then on the other side of it, from the people putting the money in, there are so many, one, we are, as a population around the world, we're all more affluent than we've ever been before. There is so much spare money out there. Um, and there are people out there who specifically want to have an impact with conservation, but they have no idea how. Mm-hmm. And having a place where they could put their money to know that professional films are going to be made, that they're not just giving it to some, you know, someone who just suddenly decided they wanted to make a film, but to a place that they can see a reputation, they can see some expertise, and they can see that there's a real chance that, you know, they can put it into something that they are interested in. 
you know, it, it's a it's a, a really useful um, entity to be there. And I think um, I'm certainly looking forward to how you get on with that and, and you know, um, and move forward. So, uh, well, w where can people find you, Alan, in terms of, you know, getting in contact with you or seeing what you're doing and staying up to date with those plans? Where can people find you? Um, yeah, so you can um, currently, obviously, TLP Media Films is where I live on the web, dot com, TLP Media Films dot com um, is where I currently have. But eventually it'll be uh, Real Earth Films with R-E-E-L Films dot org. Um, that'll be launching here soon. Um, um, so that would be the easiest way, um, either of those two sites. Uh, you could also check the, the YouTube channel out, Filming the Wild. I also have a little website, filmingthewild.com, which kind of just basically mirrors that. So that's also another way. That'll be consistent. You know, if you can't remember either, just go to filmingthewild.com. You can contact me there. Um, follow me on social media if you want, uh, Facebook or Instagram. My Instagram is Alan P underscore Lacey. Um, that's A-L-A-N-P underscore L-A-C-Y. Um, so those are the easiest ways. Facebook, just look me up. I'll, I usually just pretty much friend I accept pretty much all friend requests. Um, so yeah, those are the easiest ways. My email, if I don't know if you want that too, but that's just um, currently alien at tlpmediafilms.com. Fantastic. Well, it just, you know, people can reach out to you and stay connected and, and see how they may be able to get involved with what you're doing. And I'll put all of those links on the website page, so it's um, on it's either jakewellers.com or masterwildlifefilmmaking.com, and I'll put on your episode page, I'll put links so people can also go there and click directly on them. And finally, Alan, what would you say, what would be your biggest piece of advice to people who are in this place of they know that this is what they want to do? You know, they're inspired, they're motivated, and we know how that can wane. And, you know, um, what is your piece of advice for people in that place of knowing this is what they want to do, but just unsure of how to get there? I would say, um, like you know, kind of what you said earlier and what a lot of folks primary is just to get out and do. But on top of just being able to get out and do it, I mean, you can sit and plan and you can think about all the ways and strategize of how you want to do it. But until you actually go and do it, um, you don't learn anything really. You, you, as soon as you do it, you learn so many different cool things about the whole process. Um, but coupled with that, um, if you can surround yourself with somebody that uh, understands the industry, maybe maybe a mentor, maybe someone who can just provide advice, um, feel free to reach out to someone like myself or, or like Jake or, who, or whoever um, that you can connect with. I think those kind of connections are good. So learning how to network um, and learning you know, how to just go out and do those two things. I think if you take anything away from anything is those two things are the most important aspect that I have learned in moving forward that I would give advice is if you can network with people and if you could just get out and do like the world is your oyster at that point. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm just going to add to that, that, you know, the, the, the getting out and doing always, I mean, is the best advice. It's just like, just go and do it. And then you've got something you can work, build upon. The hard part with that is when we do that, when any of us do that with new things we're doing, it can always seem like when we fail, it's only happening to us, right? We're the only ones failing. We're the ones that did that and it went wrong or it didn't work and now what? Well, the, the point is just to keep doing because you learn from those experiences like Correct. Alan has, like like you have with your experience of making gray area. And that was a huge bite to take of the filmmaking world, but you achieved it. And Chris Morgan mm -hmm. uh, narrates it, I believe as well. Yep, right. So, correct. you know, you yep. achieved it with a great group of people. It's a fantastic film. Um, but you, you did that and I'm sure had many trials and errors as you went through. But you have to just many pick failures. yourself up and keep <laughs> Yeah. You have to pick yourself yep. up and keep going. And then that just get started is just get started. It, you will fail. You'll trip mm -hmm. over. You'll fall on your face over and over and over. But that is the path to success. That's how we all get there. We've all been there. We've all had mud on our face and lots of other thing on our face. So, uh, you know, it's yeah, just one of those eventually, things. Eventually you get to the point where you you learn the taste of mud and it's like, you know, it's not as bad as I thought it was. There you go. You just spit it out and you carry on. 
Yep. Alan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be on the podcast. It's, it's full of great information, such valuable information. I uh, can't wait to see how it goes with your uh, real um, Earth films and, uh, and the nonprofit. So all the best with that. And thanks again. Thank you so much, Jake. Appreciate it. If you have enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, then please consider leaving a rating and a comment. And subscribe if you haven't already done so from wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. The ratings really help rank the podcast and get more people to find it. Also, if you know someone who is into wildlife filmmaking, or maybe they're a nature photographer and they're looking to transition and they aren't listening to the podcast currently, please tell them about it. Word of mouth is the best way for me to build my listeners uh, for this podcast. I would very much appreciate it. And also, if you are looking to break into the wildlife filmmaking industry and you're just looking for help, you're looking for answers for burning questions that you have, then please consider looking at my Master Wildlife Filmmaking Mentoring uh, Group and Mentorship Program. You can find that at Jake Willers dot com and just click on the mentoring tab or learn more tab where it says it on just the home page there you can find it very very easily and then lastly if you want to help support this podcast the best way you can do it other than just telling other people about the podcast is to go to our patreon page it's patreon.com forward slash m w f p that's patreon.com m forward slash mwfp and there you can get all sorts of bonus content we have extracts from podcasts that didn't make it to the these episodes because they went on so long uh, because i didn't want to stop talking with our guests so we put the extra content there there are catch up conversations with previous guests finding out what they've been doing since i last spoke to them and so much more of the behind the scenes please consider taking a look that is the best way to sponsor this podcast and get more episodes in the future.